Good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. It's a couple of days away. 218 is gone. So as we gather this morning, on this Sunday after Christmas, we do so with a sigh of relief. <laughs> the gifts have been opened. The family has come and returned home. The past month typically holds the busiest days and weeks of the year for many of us. It's a little wonder that we might feel a little tired today <laughs> after all that. It's been a hectic couple of weeks. Slowly our lives returning back to normal, whatever normal might be for you, as we go back into our regular routines. So we celebrated the birth of Christ. So who is this Jesus? At whose birth the herald angels sang, whose birthday 2,000 plus years ago is still celebrated by people of all classes and all races all over the world. You know, it strained the limits of human language to try to answer that question. In the New Testament, the writers use an endless succession of, of titles in their attempt to capture the scope of his greatness. We're reminded that Jesus came to bring salvation to all people. In the Old Testament, it was the high priest, if you remember, who was immediate between God and his people. His job was to regularly offer animal sacrifices according to the law and intercede with God for forgiveness for the people's sins. Jesus is now the high priest. He came to earth as a human being. Therefore, he understands our weaknesses and shows mercy to us. He has once and for all paid that penalty for our sins by his own sacrificial death. And he could be dependent on to restore our broken relationship with God. We are released from sin's domination over, our, over us when we commit ourselves fully to Christ, trusting completely in what he has done for us. Jesus is God's present to each and every one of us. We must respond to that gift as well as by allowing Jesus to enter and change our lives daily. Our focus for the, the days following Christmas and before the start of the new year is to reflect an event of this past year. News magazines have special reports and year-end reports and highlighting the, the good and the bad from the previous 12 months. Television news programs will review all those good and bad things that have occurred in the, pro, in the news over the past year. They're going to do that by asking and answering the question of whether or not this has been a good or bad year. We ask ourselves that same question. Was this a good year for us or a bad year? We kind of weigh the, the odds, the pros and cons. The same way we need to reflect on our faith. Has this past year been one of growth or one of stagnation in our walk with Christ? The last month we have focused on the baby Jesus. During worship on December the 9th, we sang the Christmas carol asking the question, What child is this? And we answered that the baby was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So our question this morning is, What do we do with Jesus now that we celebrated Christmas? Do we pack him away with the manger scene? Get him out again next December. Or do we claim or reclaim Jesus as our Lord and Savior? A question worthy of our reflection today is, how has God's gift, his very son Jesus, changed our lives? Thomas Marine Dowd recalled the Christmas that she received one of those wooden horses with the bouncing springs. Y'all ever see one of those or ever ride one of those as a kid? The only bad news when that thing throws you. Worse than a real horse. Makes you wonder, do I really want to get out of that again? But she named her horse Trigger. You can you probably figure out who that was after. And she rode him every day. Much to her dismay, though, one morning she discovered that her beloved horse was gone. No longer in the corral. Her mother explained to a poor woman and her, and her son spotted Trigger. As they were walking past the house. And the young boy stared longingly at the horse. And Maureen recalls how her mother's world had been turned upside down when she lost her father at the age of 12. And as a result, her, 
Her mother always had a soft spot for, for children who were hurt and in need. On a modest pension, her mother would always send something to the children's hospital or give it to a fund or charity. Marine didn't want to accept the news that had always been given to another child, a total stranger. I was crushed, she writes. And whenever she and her mother got into a, a hassle or a, an argument over the next 16 years, she always brought up the fact she gave her horse away. And on her 21st birthday, Marine came home to find her bouncing horse with a handwritten note in its mouth. I'm back, signed Trigger. Many years have passed, and Marine is thankful for the lesson her mother taught her at a young age. Materialism and narcissism can only smother life and Christmas if you let. The author of the book of Hebrews gives us a different perspective of Jesus' life. The other side of Jesus, who, which we often lose sight of in the midst of the heralding angels and the visiting magi and the brilliantly shining stars. This forgotten side of Jesus is his humanity. You know, each Sunday, our acolytes and senior acolytes light these two candles on the altar. They remind us of Christ's divinity and Christ's humanity. The scriptures is fully human, fully divine. That's what his candles up here represent, his humanity and his divinity. And we forget about that. You know, we forgot that side of Christ, his humanity. Hebrews was addressed to people who had gone through a tough time, a time of suffering, fierce persecution, socially and physically, imprisonment, and confiscation of property. The author wrote, hoping to instill a sense, of, a fresh sense of hope, desiring people to turn to Jesus. We discover that the author claims that Jesus is the pioneer of our salvation. He didn't need to suffer for our salvation, or for his own salvation, because he was God in human form. His perfect obedience demonstrates that he was a complete sacrifice for us. Through suffering, Christ completed the work necessary for our salvation. Our salvation, can, or suffering, can make us more sensitive to being servants to God. People who have known pain are able to reach out with compassion others who hurt. If you have suffered, ask God how he, your experience can be used to help others. God's grace to us led Christ to his death. Jesus didn't come into the world to gain political power or status, but to suffer and die so that we could have eternal life. You know, it's difficult for us to identify with Christ's servant attitude. Perhaps we need to evaluate our own motives. Are we more interested in power or participation, domination or service, getting or giving? Which tips the scale for us? Jesus' suffering made him a perfect leader or pioneer of our salvation. A pioneer goes ahead to clear a path for others to follow. There's a sense of, a, of adventure associated with a pioneer going where no one else has gone before. But on an adventure, it takes courage. The pioneer is motivated by the conviction that there is a better place somewhere out there and will stop at nothing until it's found. So we have the author of Hebrews who portrays Jesus as a pioneer who opens the way to God. In a sense, Jesus broke down all the walls of separating people from their, their God. People have been searching for a way to to God, to return to Him. And through His life and His death and new life, Jesus clears a way for us to enter into a relationship with God. Jesus is truly gone where no one has gone before, leading the way to God the Father. And we discover through Jesus that God desires to be in a relationship with us and bringing many children to glory. So Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and he achieved the goal God set before him, making a pioneer of our salvation perfect through sufferings. You know, perfection signifies completeness. 
Through his suffering and death, Jesus gained glory, not only for himself, but for many children. In fact, for all people, for all of us. And thanks to Jesus, we can count ourselves as God's own children today. Because through Jesus' life, he has made a new future available to each and every one of us. We may from time to time, you know, endure setbacks and suffering here on earth, but thanks to Jesus, we could look forward to the future. For God is the last word for each one of us. When you look at this, at this book, another image the author of Hebrews employs is that Jesus is our brother. In verse 9 it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honors, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. This verse is in reference to Psalm 8, which is a psalm about man. There the psalmist said, Man has been made a little lower than the angels. The writer of Hebrews asserts that the name, the same thing about Jesus. But what we said about man can also be said about Jesus. In verse 11 it says that both he who suffers, or he who sanctifies, which is Jesus, and those who are sanctified, which is man, are from one father. This literally means out of one. It refers to the source from which they came. We have been set apart by God's service, cleansed and made holy, sanctified by Jesus, now have the same Father He has. So we are made His brothers and sisters. Because God has adopted all believers as His children, Jesus calls them His brothers and sisters. So we are Christ's brothers and sisters. Well, Jesus is the Son of God. He was also human. He experienced everything we have growing up. Jesus partook of flesh and blood. Those have aspects of life in which all men share. Jesus became like his brethren in all things. As an infant, he experienced his mother's love as she held him and cared for his needs. There was also a close bond between Mary and Jesus built upon the foundation of love. As a young man, Jesus would learn carpentry skills from Joseph. Jesus would work crafting wooden items for other people. He experienced every emotion we experience. He knew what it felt like to be loved and also to fall out of favor with people. He must have felt a disappointment, especially when his chosen disciples didn't grasp his objective. And like us, he might have even felt discouraged from time to time. Jesus understands us because he shared all these experiences. And we can identify with someone who knows and understands what we experience. Jesus isn't ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. The author of Hebrews claims, For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one father. And for this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. It's an act of grace to be included in God's family. Jesus blazed a, a path for us to follow that led to God. And we follow Jesus down the path knowing he experienced that wide range of emotions that we do. And we identify closely with Jesus because he became one of us. That's the definition of incarnation. His humanity was important because it enabled Jesus to relieve man. The glorious result of the humanity of Jesus is that he's able to understand what we're going through. Verse 18 says, for since he himself has passed through the test of suffering, he's able to help those who are meeting their test now. Another image to consider is that Jesus is our liberator who came to set us free and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. You know, sometimes we feel ourselves drawn into situations we'd rather avoid. Many people struggle with variations of addiction and vices. People caught up in destructive addictions need to help an intervention of another one to pull them through that time. Jesus is our liberator. Sets us free to start over again. And only Jesus has that power to break the hold of sin in our lives. Through the conviction, crucifixion, and risen Christ, God confronts evil with love. Christ sets us free. 
Therefore, it says he had become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. You know, when you get tired and don't think you can go on, he understands. When you are treated unfairly by others, he understands. When those who love you most dearly let you down, he understands. <laughs> When you are confronted by temptation so powerful it sweeps you off your feet, he understands. When your parents don't understand you or your brothers and sisters make fun of you, he understands. When you're not out in the crowd, he understands. When your best laid plans are, are sabotaged by the jealousy and evil of others, he understands that also. When you stand at the tomb of a of one you love very dearly and your and your heart is breaking and you're crying, why did this have to happen? He understands. Because of his humanity, he can sympathize with us. Because of his sympathy with us, he's also able to help us. He can truly say about us, I know what you're going through. And he'll redeem us from this bondage, restore us to our rightful place before God. Jesus, the high priest, is a theme that the author of Hebrews de develops further in the epistle. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Jesus offers himself to redeem us from our bondage and love so that our rightful place before God can be restored. Kate was in the seventh grade when her father died. A week later, Kay was back at school even though her life had been filled with grief of losing her dad. On the first day back, Kay was called to the principal's office for a chat. Mr. Kirk told her that he knew how hard it must have been to lose her father. However, the best way to, to work through that grief is to reach out to others, he told her. So he invited her to join what he called the subs for Sam. So drive the collected food and toys for the needy families within the school. And Kay joined six other students in mid-December to deliver presents and food to area families. It was a wonderful experience for her as she met with the other students. Even though there was still plenty of presents and foods in the van, the other students were dropped off at their homes, she remembers. We came to my house, Kay recalls, and I wished Mr. Cook a Merry Christmas and ran inside. And a few moments later, there was a knock on the door. It was Mr. Cook, the food and toys and the presents. See, the entire school had been collecting presents for Kay's family. Kay was so touched, she had on the stairs and cried. Kay remembers that Christmas of being thankful to her school for showing my family the true meaning of Christmas. Years later, she fondly recalls that, that story to her own children. She says, Christmas is to remember first Jesus, second others, and last yourself. Tuesday, we will enter the year of 2019. We don't know what the future holds for any of us. But thanks to Jesus, we know who holds that future. We might not have received everything we wanted, or maybe we feel that post-Christmas let us down. However, we have one thing we really need, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one present we don't need to return, but to keep forever.